Yes, thanks so much for having me. It's a real pleasure and an honor to, to be here uh, at Syracuse on a, on a beautiful day. Uh, before we talk about the specific topic that I want to address, and that is the role of armed non-state actors in state building. Um, are, are they always an obstacle? Can they be folded into state building initiatives um, using the case of Somalia to drill down a little bit on that? Um, I'd like to just step back and take stock of state building uh, in general, because we often forget to do this. Uh, we just presume that this is a laudable enterprise or a hopeless enterprise um, and don't actually look at where we are. Um, if you take a look at the biggest state building initiatives uh, that the world has undertaken since roughly 1990, since the end of the Cold War, um, the list, my list anyway, uh, would go something like this. You would certainly have to include Afghanistan and Iraq, South Sudan and Somalia, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Haiti, East Timor and Kosovo, both trusteeships, so they have to be thrown into the mix. After that, my list gets a little amorphous. I think we could argue about which ones were uh, most important. Certainly Sierra Leone and, and Liberia might qualify. There are some others as well. Uh, then when you take a look at the Fund for Peace failed states, or now fragile states index uh, for this past year, what kind of numbers do you get? Well, from that same list, Afghanistan is the number ninth most fragile state, Iraq number 12, South Sudan number one, Somalia number two, very happy to be displaced by South Sudan, um, DRC number five, Haiti number 11, um, and then some interesting numbers, East Timor 34, Kosovo isn't numbered because it's only partially recognized, Liberia number 21, and Sierra Leone number 31. Now, what does this say? Um, what it says is that um, we've had, uh, we've put an, an enormous amount of money and time and energy into state building. Um, and in many of the biggest state building projects globally, um, we have not seen much success. These countries continue to be considered among the most fragile or failed states in the world. But we have had a few. Uh, some of those numbers from, from East Timor to Sierra Leone to Liberia, however fragile the success has been, it's been real. Um, and so uh, part of my argument is uh, what you're going to hear from Somalia today is pretty pessimistic. Uh, I don't want you to leave the room just throwing your hands up and saying state building is a fool's errand. It never works because, in fact, sometimes it does. Um, what we've had uh, in some is uh, a lot of failures and frustrations, but just enough successes to keep us in the game. Um, and frankly, even if we didn't have those successes, it's not clear that we have any other options except to try to continue to support uh, countries and societies that are trying to rebuild or build for the first time uh, a viable state because the alternative is letting them burn. The imperative is to get it right. Um, the, high, the, the combination of this imperative to get it right with high frustration and failure rates has led to some very interesting mood swings uh, in the U.S. government and U.S. population at large. We go from uh, embracing enthusiastically a state building project in Afghanistan to walking away with our fingers smoking, saying never again, this is, this is not going to work, uh, back and forth. I, um, uh, as, as someone who was in Somalia in 1993-94, at one of the very first of the post-Cold War state building initiatives um, can attest to this. I've had a front row seat uh, in watching this now for 25 years. Um, we were very enthusiastic in Somalia 93, and by 94, um, we're, we're, we weren't even allowed to use the words nation building or state building for a few years uh, because of how badly it went there. The reality is that state building is hard. State building is expensive. State building is slow. The World Bank has told us, according to its empirical research, that even in the best of circumstances, rebuilding a state after a war takes at least 20 years. Uh, that's in the best case circumstances. I have uh, been at meetings, uh, very unhelpful academics have gone to the UN at a conference, um, and one uh, uh, said to the poor UN officials, says, you know, the hardest part of state building is really uh, the first 500 years. Uh, yeah, thank you. That's true. Uh, intensely unhelpful. Um, there are, of course, high failure rates. We have limited tools uh, for how to go about uh, catalyzing state building in these circumstances. Um, and we have a limited capacity for getting context right. And context, of course, is critical. One of the most frequent mistakes that we make uh, is to impose a template um, on countries without regard to local context. Well, that's, 
it's easy to say we have to privilege local context, try to find it uh, in a country like DRC where it's very, very difficult uh, to, to get that close local knowledge that you need. The good news is that we're better at analyzing the challenges of state building today than we were 25 years ago. When I was out in Somalia uh, with UNISOM, we were literally making it up as we went along. No one had tried this. Uh, well, we kind of tried it in Cambodia, but Cambodia was different because that was, in a, that was an intact state. That was really a trusteeship over an intact state. Here we've got a state that's completely disintegrated and you're trying to start from scratch rebuilding it. Um, we know a lot more now, especially about the political economy dynamics of state building, the interests that are at play, either in promoting state building or at subverting state building. Um, and that has helped us to identify, to, to, to identify a key difference in the settings that we're looking at. One is essentially a tame problem of state building versus a wicked problem. Wicked problem is a great engineering, systems and engineering term uh, that I like to import uh, into social science. Uh, a tame problem in the case of state building is a solvable one. That is to say you've got governing authorities who are willing but not able to extend their authority and the services we associate with a state. A wicked problem is when you've got governing authorities who have neither the will nor the uh, capacity to govern. The former invites capacity building interventions. The latter invites capacity building interventions that are destined to fail. The latter, when you've got a wicked problem of state building where you've got political elites who have a vested interest in actually perpetuating conditions of durable disorder and state failure or weakness, turns state building into a very attractive project but not a very interesting outcome. We can keep doing this for as long as you would like to write checks for us, uh, but we have very little interest in actually seeing it succeed. Uh, we all know the cases where that has happened from Afghanistan to Somalia uh, and others. This task, um, well, let me, let me back up and just say the, the, the wicked problem um, includes this question of what to do about armed non-state actors, which tend to be ubiquitous, in context of state failure, typically associated with the end of a civil war, which are often spoilers or can be used as spoilers against state building and peace, peace, peace building initiatives, what do you do? Are they always part of the problem uh, or can they be part of the solution? We'll take a look at the Somali case uh, to see if we can find answers to that. The conventional answers to this question of armed non-state actors uh, is typically one of three options. The first is DDR, demobilization, disarmament, reintegration. You identify the armed groups, you cantone them, you provide training for them for civilian work of some kind, and then reintegrate them into society. This is laudable, sometimes it works, but it's incredibly difficult to do. And for those of us who've watched it on the ground, one of the key problems is that it's a reversible process that if tensions flare, uh, it's not difficult to go right back to picking up weapons. But even when tensions don't flare, even when the peace is sustained, you've got tens and tens of thousands of armed youth who many, in, in many cases have no education, they have no training in a, a civilian economy, their gun is their job, as they like to say. Uh, you give them some training, they go out into an, an economy where unemployment levels are 70 or 80 percent. You're setting them up for failure. And after a while, they get frustrated and they return to the gun. They make ready recruits into armed ga criminal gangs, uh, militia, um, or, or worse. The second uh, uh, possibility is to integrate them into the security sector. This is the easy, lazy way to do it. Let's take the militia and now we deputize them as police or the military. You're, now you're a brigade and you get a uniform. Um, this has all kinds of potential problems. We've seen this is one of the many reasons for the crisis in South Sudan, uh, that these armed tribal militia were never properly integrated into the army. They were, they were hatted in the army, but they stayed separate units um, and eventually started fighting among themselves. We're very easily mobilized. 
Uh, it's also the case that taking young men who have, in some cases, been hardened into acts of uh, violence and impunity uh, and then suddenly uh, expecting them to be police or security forces um, is unrealistic. They're going to be predatory in their, in, their, in their relations with local communities. Um, and that certainly happened in many of these cases. The third is to just defeat them outright. Um, and that's a great option uh, if you happen to have that as a, a scenario at your disposal. But most of these countries that we're talking about are negotiated pieces where the war has gone on and on for a long time. It's a, a stalemate uh, that results in a transitional government, uh, a negotiated peace, uh, no winners, no losers. In the case of Somalia, let me give you a little bit of context uh, to understand some of the, the uh, information I'm going to share. Somalia is one of the world's most severe cases of state failure. We can call it a fragile state if it makes you feel better, um, but the fact is it's a failed state. Uh, the government, and I say this, the president is an old friend of mine. We even co-authored a chapter together. I wish him well, uh, but the reality is after three years of governing, um, his government still can't even control most of the neighborhoods of the capital, Mogadishu, much less anything in the countryside provides very few resources. Um, it is recognized internationally, so it has, it has ju juridical sovereignty without earning the empirical sovereignty uh, that we've come to expect uh, of member states of the United Nations. Uh, this has gone on for 25 years, so this is one of the longest running instances of state failure or state collapse. This has huge implications. Somalia has a youth bulge, 74% of its population is under the age of 30, you do the math. It's been a collapsed state for 25 years. That means 75% or more of the population has no living memory of what a state is even supposed to do. That's a whole new level of state building than you might have normally expected. This is, this is going to be a huge, huge project there. The state is protected currently by 22,000 African Union peacekeeping forces called AMISOM. Were it not for AMISOM's presence, this state would probably be on boats out to sea. Uh, it would be driven out by armed groups, most notably Shabaab, that we'll talk about in a few minutes. The security sector of the, of, of the government is the largest part of the government. It includes six brigades. These brigades have received uh, extensive training uh, salary support and weapons and ammunition from the outside world, including us. But the brigades are all clan paramilitaries. They are not integrated. Different brigades are linked to particular clans. They answer to the commander who is looking after clan interests. There's no chain of command up to civilian authorities. So these are essentially armed units doing what's best for their particular community. And in some cases, that means going into parts of southern Somalia and along with Amisom, ousting al-Shabaab from these areas. So we now have liberated areas or recovered zones in southern Somalia in places like the lower Shabele here, and then claiming it as theirs. With the local community saying, thank you so much for liberating us from al-Shabaab, but now you've just replaced one form of occupation with another. Uh, these, these armed uh, brigades are very predatory um, and, and, and sometimes ruthless uh, with regard to the local population. And one of the great frustrations for many of us is that our taxpayer dollars are going to support these armed units that are driving the locals back into the hands of guess who? Al-Shabaab, the group that we're fighting in southern Somalia. So, Great frustration in terms of getting basic command and control over these clan, clan paramilitaries. Um, and then even bigger problems, just controlling them at the unit level because they are generally unpaid. Now, you might ask, wait a minute, you just said we were paying for them. Um, and it's true. The international community is chipping in. Different countries are paying for different brigades and units. Um, the money isn't always getting there. It's being intercepted by high-level officials. Um, and so soldiers are going four or five months without pay. What do you expect them to do? They're either going to loot uh, in order to make a living, and that alienates the local population, or they are going to defect uh, either to no one or to Shabab. Many of them have gone back and forth from Shabab to the military repeatedly, just looking for whoever will pay them a salary. In addition to the, the army, we also have police. Uh, almost all the police in Mogadishu uh, are from one clan, the president's clan. 
Uh, they do not serve as a source of law and order. Uh, instead, if you take a case to them, they typically demand a bribe. Uh, they are avoided. So what we've got is a pretty large security sector, but one that is not providing security. In fact, one that is the main source of insecurity for large sections of the population. The result, security is poor in southern Somalia. It's not Mad Max anarchy. This isn't a war of all against all. There are systems in place for people to provide varying levels of security and order for themselves. Um, but those systems involve, for the most part, armed non-state actors. The first and biggest armed non-state actor in southern Somalia today remains al-Shabaab. This is a jihadist group. I won't go into the details. It'll take forever. Uh, but this violent extremist group has been on its heels geographically for the past five years. It's lost control of the neighborhoods it controlled in Mogadishu. It's lost control of all of the main towns and cities in southern Somalia, Baidoa, Brava, Kismayo. It has now been pushed into the countryside. But if you look at the green area here that it controls, it still controls a lot of the countryside in southern Somalia. What it does today is it does not provide security for people. This is not an armed security provider in, the, in the, 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 the way that it used to when it controlled cities. Today, what it does in the cities is it actually threatens people. It extorts money. It's got a network called the Amniot, which is intact, even though the group left the neighborhoods in terms of fighting forces, they retained this network. This network knows every Somali, who they work for, how much they make, and they shake them down for taxes every month. If you don't pay the taxes, you run the risk of being targeted. And that includes some of the biggest businesses, one of the big hotels that was hit um, recently. The rumor is that's because they had their own security and was refusing to pay taxes to Shabab. Um, and so they go after that particular um, hotel. I'm getting a little leery of these because every hotel that I stayed at in Mogadishu keeps getting blown up. Uh, so I'm thinking about specializing in another country. Uh, <laughs> The key here, though, is, this is, this, is a, this is a group that's no longer providing. It's actually creating insecurity in order to profit from it. You threaten, and then you extort. That's an important theme, because Shabab is not the only group in southern Somalia that has figured this formula out. Shabab also engages in acts of terrorism. They typically are focusing on high-value targets, hard targets, spectacular complex terrorist attacks uh, that result in lots of casualties and that are designed to demoralize the government, demoralize its supporters, intimidate people from supporting it. Shabab has two other important features. One is penetration. Its Amniot network isn't just in the neighborhoods. It's right into the government. It's right into the Amisom translators. It's into some of the aid agencies. Um, they've got very good intelligence on us. They know a lot more about us than we know about them. And then the other key feature of this group is collusion. This is not what most Westerners think of when we look at this fight of the Amisom and the federal government versus Shabab. In fact, there's an enormous amount of collaboration and collusion going on between different groups. Clans will move their allegiance from one side to the other. Individuals will go back and forth frequently, sometimes at high levels. The government will see Shabab as less threatening than a local rival and will tactically collude with them. Um, as a result, a lot of the weapons and ammunition and trained individuals uh, that we set up in the government end up in Shabab's hands. The most notorious case of this um, is in Kismayo, where, which was liberated by the Kenyan forces as now part of the African Union peacekeeping uh, forces, along with a Somali group called the Ras Kamboni Militia. To give you an example of how pragmatic all these relationships are, the Ras Kamboni militia was, in 2006 and 2007, a scary jihadi movement. Their leader was on our most wanted list. Uh, they were uh, allies with al-Shabaab. Then they got in a fight over the Kismayo seaport revenues with al-Shabaab. They fought al-Shabaab over the money um, and lost. Ras Kamboni militia, which is Klan-based, uh, a clan in this area called the Ogaden, said, this is ours. Why are you taking our seaport revenue? You've got other seaports. Uh, in a fit, they switched sides and now are close allies with Ethiopia, Kenya, and the United States and have nice shiny weapons from us um, and took the seaport from Kismayo. What does that tell you? It tells you, again, an extraordinary amount of pragmatism here in terms of who is siding with what. But 
One of the things we were most hopeful about in Kismayo is that liberating Kismayo from al-Shabaab meant that al-Shabaab lost its biggest source of finances, charcoal exports. 40 to $70 million a year, we estimate, was being made by charcoal exports out of that port. Now they're going to dry up. Now they're in real trouble, right? Now, 40 to $70 million is actually a lot of cash. You don't just walk away from that. So it turns out that the Kenyan military and Ross Camboni militia figured out this was good business. They controlled the seaport. Al-Shabaab controls the hinterland where the charcoal is, so they collude. So they're working this out together. The charcoal exports are going out as much as before. Um, and these two sides that are supposed to be fighting each other are actually have been in business together. The Kenyan government, of course, denies this. And I will, too, if this is taped and you give it to them. Um, so next, what other non-state actors do we have out there besides the government and Shabab? Well, we've got a whole bunch. I'll give you a quick map. Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't put that map on there. Um, we have in Mogadishu, which I'll mostly focus on now rather than the country. First and foremost, we have district commissioners. Now, that sounds pretty innocuous, right? A district commissioner, what are they, a paper pusher, right? No, in fact, Mogadishu is divided into 16 districts. Each district commissioner controls a fiefdom. Most of these neighborhoods, not all, some are multi-ethnic, but most are clan-based. Even the multi-ethnic ones are dominated by one clan. The district commissioner is the head of that clan's paramilitary. Even though he has no right to do so, he, ex he controls a clan paramilitary that is essentially a protection racket in his fiefdom. Can the police go in there? No. Well, they can try. They'll get shot at. Can the military go in there? Only with permission. You better let them know before you come into their checkpoints. Who are these clan pa paramilitary? Well, they're all militia, mili uh, people in the army and the police who are double dipping. So they're getting a salary sometimes uh, from the military or the police, but then they're working for the district commissioner. These are the most powerful individuals in terms of armed actors in Mogadishu. The government has tried to marginalize them. The mayor has tried to fire them, sometimes successfully, but then they'll be replaced by a nephew who en ends up just being you know, the, 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 the token while the, the real warlord is still um, in power. This protection that they provide in these districts is real. Some of these districts are quite safe. In fact, the reason that some of them are multi-ethnic is because they do provide good protection. And those places are safer to live. Real estate values go way up as a result. But the protection is uneven. If you're from the clan of that warlord, you are the district commissioner. You've got strong protection. Otherwise, you're renting. Um, you're, 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 you're buying protection from them, uh, but it's not as strong. And in still other cases, if you are an internally displaced person and one in four Somalis living in Mogadishu today, about three to 400,000 of them are internally displaced from the famine and war. Um, you have no protection at all. You are essentially being preyed on uh, by these militia, these paramilitary. Uh, they've, they've set up camps to attract and divert humanitarian aid. The camp managers are actually called black cats in Somalia uh, for their role in diverting the aid. Um, and there's very little that they can do about that. Next, there are neighborhood watch groups. Uh, people have not been passive victims uh, in the face of state collapse. They've gotten together and established uh, informal watch groups uh, with varying degrees of effectiveness, but all extra constitutional, all illiberal. There are business militia. The larger businesses in Mogadishu, which are pretty robust, have hundreds of armed men protecting their fixed assets, protecting their vehicles. These are full-time security forces. They are dedicated. They are almost always from the Klan, unless it's transportation. And then there's this fascinating multi-Klan. You have to pick members from different clans in order to navigate through whichever roads that you want to get to. Um, these tend to be the most reliable sources of protection, but just for the business, except for one little caveat. The areas that are the most secure in Mogadishu, which have tended to be in this area right here. This is the airport compound that, Unis that Amazon uh, and the UN uh, uh, occupy. This is the famous K4, uh, kilometer four intersection. This is where some of the biggest businesses are, and then up into Bakara, the famous Bakara market. These areas have business militia that provide security, not just for the hotel or the Coca-Cola bottling factory or whatever it is that they're protecting, but they tend to cooperate with one another. 
They have radios, they share information, they share intelligence, there's something suspicious, so they talk to one another. Well, what happens is they create an umbrella of security in that whole neighborhood. So there are free riders who are crowding into those neighborhoods who don't pay a cent for security, but who are benefiting from these, this collection of business militia that are providing security for the whole neighborhood. Again, you can imagine how expensive real estate is in those areas. There's huge difference uh, in the cost of real estate in one part of Mogadishu to another, uh, and it's all driven by security. Then there are the private security companies. They don't run a hotel or Coca-Cola bottling factory or a remittance company. They are there just to sell security and protection. There are dozens of them. Some are very small. Some are quite large, well-established, have their own websites. They cost a lot of money, but they are essential. They are essential for anyone. Any Somali who's important has to have private security. They're essential for any foreigner who's visiting. They're making big money. One of the worries about this group is that they have an incentive to perpetuate chronic insecurity to ensure good business. The government has at times threatened to close them down, but the reality is the, some of the owners of the biggest private security companies are members of parliament and ministers. So you've got ironic situations where a, you know, a, a minister of defense is also running a private security company uh, it's win-win. Where are their security forces coming from? The military and the police, of course, which is illegal. You're not supposed to do it, but when I was there last summer, uh, I had four armed guards with me in the vehicle at all time, um, and they were all wearing military uniforms. Uh, that's just uh, how it is. Now, again, if you think through the political economy of this, uh, that means that there's a whole set of categories of people for whom this situation is actually working out rather well. I'm in the military. I get paid from time to time for that. Uh, I'm also in private security, and I get paid regularly for that. I'm double dipping. Everyone, it's win-win as long as the foreigners are willing to pay the salaries uh, of both. There are other militia uh, that I'll skip in the interest of time. Regional paramilitaries uh, from regional states that are self-declared. Varying degrees of professionalism and capacity, but growing in importance. What does all this mean for state building? Well, the observations that I've come away with include the following. First, there are a combination of cultural and political economy factors in Somalia that are reinforcing the role of non-state security providers. On the cultural side, it's clan. In the absence of an effective formal security sector, Somalis are falling back to their clan as a principal source of protection. This is very uneven protection because some clans are strong and some are weak. Those who are in weak clans are not benefiting from this. Those who are in strong clans are. And frankly, they trust their clan paramilitaries, their clan militia far more than they would uh, a state security authority. At the same time, we've got these political economy factors that I've described, vested interest in the status quo that have no incentive to overcome this. They have lots of incentive to talk the talk but not walk the walk when it comes to doing something about the non-state armed actors. Related to this, the commoditization of security in Somalia. Too many interests in making a living off of creating insecurity and then providing protection from it. A third observation, these non-state security providers are, in general, more legitimate locally than the state. They don't have complete support. They have variable support depending on which group and where. But in a number of cases, the local community, especially their fellow clans people, um, will rally to their support if the state tries to marginalize them. The conclusion is that non-state security providers will remain a powerful reality in Somalia for some time to come. This is not going to go away anytime soon. What are the policy implications? The policy implications are that a state that wants to expand its authority in Somalia is going to have to do so not by marginalizing or absorbing these non-state armed groups, but negotiating with them. In the short term, some of these armed non-state actors are just as strong, if not stronger, than the state itself. 
And so if the state wants to claim authority, it's going to have to be through a mediated arrangement with these district commissioners, with these clan paramilitaries and others. And in fact, that's not uh, a speculation on my part. That's an empirical observation. That is exactly what's been happening in Somalia over the past four years. To the extent that the government can claim that it has authority over these areas, pro-government administrations, those are all negotiated arrangements with armed groups that are willing to tolerate being affiliated with the government for about as long as it's convenient and lucrative to do so. But they can walk away at any point in time. What are the long-term implications of this? Well, the short-term implications is this is messy. This is an incredibly messy security and governance context that Somalis, millions of Somalis, have to live in. And one of the things that constantly astounds me is how adept Somalis are at navigating this. It's not a simple matter. Just to get from one part of Mogadishu to the University of Mogadishu or to Bakara Market involves knowing an enormous amount about each roadblock, which district commissioner and his paramilitary controls what, what the relationships are between them, how much it costs to get through them. Uh, Somalis spend a huge amount of time learning, talking with one another, staying in communication about who, when you can go where um, and how dangerous it is. Um, and as a result, they're somehow able to live lives in this very messy, complex, mediated, uh, political situation, uh, get married, have kids, go to school, move mangoes from the countryside into the city, uh, but it's a lot of work, and it's way more than foreigners can do. Foreigners trying to figure this out lose every single time. Uh, we are in no position uh, to try to, uh, to figure this out. In the long run, the big question is, first, what do we do as outsiders with regard to these non-state actors? Do we engage them? Do we try to marginalize them? Do we recognize them in these mediated arrangements with the state? They're pretty indigestible for a lot of outside actors because they don't have formal title. For the military, it's often a lot, e in, in intelligence, it's often a lot easier. You work with whoever, whichever dance partner presents himself or herself in the, in, in the area. And so uh, we have more than a few of these non-state armed groups that are collaborating with the Ethiopian government, the Kenyan government, US, and others. The danger there is, again, are we incentivizing their, uh, their interests in remaining stronger than the state, perpetuating state weakness, because then they become an invaluable ally. And this is hardly unique to Somalia. Afghanistan has had this problem uh, for a very, very long time, that our security concerns start trumping and overriding our state building uh, concerns, that they're not, in fact, um, um, th that they are, at least in the short term, mutually exclusive. What about recognizing them as potential sources of governance? To go back to state building, under what circumstances should we be engaging with these groups? Well, UNDP is asking about this question in real time. I just got the email last week. Uh, can, you, can you be part of a Skype conversation about this? How do we address issues of local governance when we've got these self-declared entities that are governing kind of an area, at least controlling it, uh, do we try to build them up or is that illegitimate? Are we working against state building? It's a case by case deliberation. The fact is some of these are just really nasty warlord fiefdoms and shouldn't get anywhere close to them. But in other cases, what we've encountered is some pretty impressive governance at the local level. Some of the most impressive governance, in fact, doesn't even involve armed groups. It involves municipalities. One of the things that has been very impressive in Somalia is to see at the most local level, the most innocuous level, Somalis pulling together in small towns and neighborhoods to provide for themselves basic governance services. And the people who are attracted to that tend to be both Somalis from Somalia and the Somali diaspora, which comes back looking for a role to play but not the diaspora that's looking for a lot of money. They go straight to the central government. These are the diaspora that really want to help their people. 
they gravitate toward the municipal level. Why? Because that's where the real governance gets done. That's where everyone has to pick up the trash, everyone has to clean up the roads, we've got to have the, the, the school open. It's very nuts and bolts, apolitical, and there's not much money in it. So it tends to attract the very best people, not the corrupt ones. And we have, as a result, towns across parts of southern and, and northern Somalia that are run really quite well. I countered one in northern Somalia that had a mayor nicknamed Chicago. Guess why? Because he came back from Chicago. Um, who was overseeing a town that had an underground pipe water system, thanks to UNICEF, that was self-funded, uh, that had uh, land titles that were nicely organized, so no land disputes, clean roads, you name it, the market, every stall was paying a small tax, clean and orderly, safe as can be. Um, that's where the real governance is going. So then the question for the foreigners is, do we help? And the worry is, if we help, are we going to throw money at it and start creating the very problems that uh, exist at the, at the national level? You have to be very surgical and careful about the kind of support you can give to these groups. The long-term issue uh, is more worrisome, and that is, in the long term, do these expressions of subnational governance and armed state uh, actors, are they impediments to state building or can they be folded into uh, an emerging state? And here, basically, what we mostly have to draw on is history. Uh, we go back to Charles Tilley, which I assume half of you have been forced to read against your will. Uh, if not, you will soon enough. Uh, and that is the observation that most modern states were in fact born uh, of criminal networks, bandits and others who little by little um, won out oh, in these mediated arrangements over time. Uh, gained more power, were out to outmaneuver uh, their local rivals. And here, the sovereign state, for as weak as it is in places like South Sudan and Somalia, has a few advantages. It has sovereignty. It's got recognition. That counts for something. It has access to foreign aid. It has the power of the purse. If you've got leaders who really want to consolidate authority, uh, they can co-opt, they can draw in, they can marginalize these armed groups slowly over time. But this gets us back to the tame versus wicked problem. Do the leaders want to? If you've got conditions where a leader in a country like Afghanistan or South Sudan or Somalia appears, not just the leader, but his entire circle, uh, a mafioso circle has an interest in perpetuating these conditions, there is actually, in my view, very little that we can do to help. Uh, these crises will go on and on and on. Um, and I think that's what we're likely to see in that list uh, that I shared with you. Some of them uh, have leadership that really is committed to state building. They will break away. They will do better. And some of these, I think, we're going to be talking about in this room for another 20 years. With that, I will turn the floor over to you all for comments, questions, critiques. Yes, sir. You know, all the efforts that were um, that are going into Solid, unified state of Somalia. Why is why is that the ideal outcome instead of having? Okay, you're asking the now the big question. I love this question, um, and that is, you know, why are we still operating on the assumption that the modern sovereign state is the only organi political organizing force in the universe, and that everyone has to replicate themselves in our own image? Um, and that I love to ask that question. It's a very provocative question in a place like Somalia. Um, one can make the case that what we're seeing in places like Somalia are not a, a fall backwards to pre-colonial 19th century Africa, but instead actually the cutting edge of a post-post-colonial state uh, in Africa that is forming itself with its own logic, saturated in its own culture, that in fact, when it emerges, is not going to look like us. And that's OK. It's our problem to try to understand and interpret how they are organizing themselves. Easy to say, but the reality is, for now, that the world is still organized very much by states, states under siege, states whose sovereignty is being questioned right and left uh, every day, uh, but still organized around states. So it's, and, and there's such big payoffs for being uh, the principal in a recognized state that I think the elites uh, won't be all that interested in this conversation. Uh, I, we, you didn't bring up um, probably because the focus of the discussion was on uh, a different topic, but the role of Putman in Somaliland in the north. Um, and I, I bring up the concern that promotion of these 
subnational, these regional groups, might encourage Puntland, Somaliland autonomy uh, of a sort that, that contributes to the fragmentation of the national government. This is a, a big concern in Somalia right now. Uh, there are two political entities in the north of Somalia that predate the current federal government of Somalia. Somaliland declared secession in 1991 uh, in the northwest. Uh, it, uh, it exists as a modestly functioning government. It has its own currency, its own president, its own parliament, uh, its own ministries. Uh, it is the most peaceful part of the Horn of Africa. It's the most democratic by a country mile, uh, not just in the Horn of Africa, but you could expand the circle quite a ways before you come into a, a political unit that's more democratic than it is. And it's pretty safe and secure, except for the disputed area uh, in between Puntland and Somaliland. Uh, no one recognizes it. And the question is, well, why not? Uh, it's been 25 years now. Uh, hasn't it paid its dues? And the answer is exactly uh, the concern you raised. And that is, if we recognize a unilateral secession, even though it's technically, from a legal point of view, a dissolution of union, they were independent for four days in 1960, that, that matters to lawyers. It's a distinction without a difference to the politicians. Um, but but it, 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 the, the, the view that if we recognize a unilateral secession, it will trigger uh, a domino effect of others in the Horn of Africa and beyond, and no one wants that. So what we've done as an international community is we've engaged it uh, as best we can. Uh, they have found ways to, uh, to provide it with uh, assistance uh, in varying ways, but without, without some of the core accoutrements of sovereignty. Um, and some argue maybe that's the best thing for it, because the minute it qualifies for a big loan from the World Bank, all of a sudden the game is going to change there. One of the reasons that Somaliland has succeeded in part is because if you want to get wealthy in Somaliland, you go into the private sector. Uh, they've gotten some, I mean, it's actually really hard to get wealthy there. It's a very, very poor place. But the private sector has more promise than the government because the government's revenues are so low. The government's revenues today, I think the latest figures were around $80 million, the entire budget. Well, my little Davidson College has a $140 million budget, and we only have 2,000 students in a campus of 300 acres. They're running an entire country. So again, the stakes are a lot lower. You throw in a few hundred million dollars in a World Bank loan, and that could change things. And of course, the other thing that could change things there is oil. Uh, Mother Nature has a hilarious sense of humor and only puts known oil reserves in disputed border areas of the Horn of Africa. Uh, that's why they're fighting over the disputed area here. Uh, because, in part, because that's where they think the oil is. Puntland uh, was established a bit later, about eight years later in the late 90s. It is a more modest government, but it is a functional autonomous government. It hasn't seceded. It, it claims that it wants to be a part of Somalia, but it's got a lot of autonomy. It runs its own seaport. It's got its own revenue, its own president. Um, and there are worries that if we engage it too much, uh, we end up incentivizing the breakup of Somalia, which for Somali nationalists is a catastrophe. You want to follow up? And I have a follow-up question. Sure. Um, then in regards to Putland and Somaliland, did we see these kind of clan-based, um, political economy-based, militant non-state actors? Or did they emerge from kind of a, a different background? Another great question. The million dollar question in Somalia, why did things go so wrong in the south and not in the north? The short answer is the north uh, in the 70s and 80s was completely ignored. Uh, there was nothing to fight over. All of the goodies were in the south. That's where the capital was. That's where all the investment was and the money. Uh, so that attracted all the militia. There was some fighting in the north, but it was contained. And part of the reason it was contained, again, this is another potential explanation that many people put forward, and that is that the clan elders were more intact in the North for a variety of historical reasons. They maintained more legitimacy and power and were in a position to keep control of their armed youth in 91, 92, 93, when in the South, the, the elders completely lost control. So the key for me is this, for whatever the reason that the fighting and looting and ethnic cleansing and a, a famine that cost 250,000 lives in southern Somalia in 91, 92. For whatever reason that happened, once it happened, it created two very different paths. Uh, you had an intact society in the north that could recover, that didn't have all the grievances that the south is dealing with, that didn't have all the land disputes that the south is dealing with. How generalizable is your thesis? Because I find it absolutely fascinating, this idea that we can have kind of non-state security mm. elites that are this amalgamation of different kind of actors who are profiting from insecurity, and that that plays a role in um, state building dynamics, governance dynamics. Could this 
be a kind of universal? I sure hope so. I, I hope it's generalizable. This is one of the banes of my existence is whenever I'm asked as the Somali guy to come to a meeting, you know, looking at one of these broad questions, um, if the findings from the Somali case fly in the face of evidence from other places, they're, well, it's sui generis. You know, Somalia is just different from everywhere else. And my feeling is if you've got a theory about state building or peace building or radical Islamism or famine or whatever else, and it doesn't, it doesn't explain Somalia, it's not a very good theory. I think Somalia should be a critical case, uh, not the outlier. But that's, that's just me uh, in my own political economy trying to protect my relevance. Um, the, I, I do think that one thing is really that, that can be gleaned from the Somali case is very generalizable. And that is, to the extent that we can focus on interests, interests in state building, interest in state failure, what we've got is an entry point, not just for good analysis, but for good policy. If we don't focus on the interests, we're going to get it wrong. We're going to go in with our little state box building toolbox and spread goodies around, and, and they're just going to, they're going to fleece us. If we focus on interests, we've got a theory of change, because interests aren't fixed. Interests change over time. They are malleable. One of the things that Somali, the Somali case shows very nicely is that some real troublemakers, spoilers to use the jargon, appear, who appeared to be total spoilers back in 91, 92, turned out to be situational spoilers. When we went in, in 1993, UNISOM went in with 30,000 troops and hundreds and hundreds of civilians like myself to try to build the country back up, we failed. But in the meantime, we spent $1.5 billion for two years in Mogadishu on ourselves. There were a whole lot of warlords who took advantage. They became contractors and procurement companies, and they, they shifted from, as we liked to put it back then, from warlord to landlord. And in the process of developing these legitimate businesses, they developed a newfound appreciation for law and order. And that's an entry point. We, you know, what we learned from that is that some of these characters who can be obstacles to state building under different circumstances can be coaxed into supporting it. Um, and that, to me, is a universal. I think we can, we can use that everywhere. Now, that's not to say that we should forgive every warlord. I mean, there are some that just need to be at the ICC. Uh, and I don't really care if they've made the transition to warlord or, from warlord to landlord. But, but for others, I think it's a, it's a good entry point. Yes. Listen, Peter. Who might be good mediators in some of these negotiations? Oh, if you ask the Somalis, they would say everyone. Ahlan wa sahlan, everyone come. They love forum shopping. The more, the better. Uh, so if they get a deal that they don't like with the Turks, they switch over to the, the, uh, the, the, the authorities from Dubai, uh, and then they bring the Italians in, or the UN every once in a while, just to keep them happy. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the fact is, no one uh, in Somalia has that, that um, untainted, um, totally neutral, fully appreciated role as a, as a mediator. Everyone is seen by the Somalis. The Somalis are very, very good at trying to figure out who's really on whose side. And for good reason. This, what I've been describing, is all about Somali dynamics. But then there's this whole other circle of foreign interests in Somalia uh, that are throwing a lot of money around. Right now, there's going to be an election of some sort. It's, it's going to be like our electoral college. This is the only country in the world that is borrowing our electoral college system. It's the worst <laughs> idea in the history of humanity. So it must work for Somalia. Um, and that is that they can't possibly hold an election under these circumstances. So they're going to bring together some representatives who are going to elect a president. And in this, we all know money is going to talk. Uh, there are four parties uh, of varying degrees of Islamism uh, vying for power. And all four have external patrons from the Gulf. So Qatar is not neutral. Uh, UAE is not neutral, Saudi is not neutral, Turks not neutral uh, at this point. Uh, it's very difficult to find a neutral party. Um, in the end, uh, it may be that the African Union um, is the only game in town. They're the ones that have, uh, because Ethiopia has really powerful interests, it's, it's the last thing from a neutral party. Um, but because it really has powerful interests there, they may, they may end up playing a role. Peter. Um, well, first of all, this has been a great talk. I, I really appreciate it. Um, but I can't help but feel that the situation uh, regarding what we outsiders should do is actually worse because um, you haven't spoke to our role as enablers of state destruction. And if you look at, I, I would argue that U.S. and other foreign aid 
contribute substantially to the forces that led the Somalis to um, um, end up in the situation that they're in. Not to okay. not to reduce their role, but I, I think we didn't know what we were doing when we were doing our foreign aid in, in the, the 80s. And, and okay, uh, well, Peter and I were both there in, in the 80s, so we got to watch this again. We had front row seats uh, in, in uh, what happened before the state collapsed, and there's certainly truth to this. One of the things that we did uh, in Somalia that really uh, set Somalia up for trouble is because Somalia is in a strategic location, you can't see the broader neighborhood, but Saudi Arabia is just to the north, so this is the strategic underbelly of the, uh, the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, during the Cold War, this was really important strategically, um, and we were willing to pour a lot of foreign aid into Somalia in order, as a quid pro quo for access to uh, an air force, uh, a, a runway in the north and a seaport in the north. That aid was not a small amount of money. Uh, and it was not just us. It was the World Bank and IMF. It was all the European Union. It was Iraq. It was China. Everyone was Somalia's friend pouring money in. So what we ended up with by the late 80s, according to some studies, is a state, 50% of its uh, recurring budget was foreign funded and 100% of its development budget was foreign funded. And it had one of the largest standing armies in Africa. Again, that was all a castle built on sand. It was all dependent on this continued flow of money in. Well, end of the Cold War arrives. It actually arrives a little early in the Horn of Africa. By 1988, the Ruskies have essentially pulled out of Ethiopia. Uh, we now have the luxury of thinking about our foreign policy alliances and foreign aid through the lens of, of uh, ethics and human rights for the first time. Um, and the government was embarked on a vicious campaign against some rebels in the north, destroyed the second largest city up there. We froze foreign aid on human rights grounds. And everyone else followed suit. And what happened very quickly is that castle built on sand collapsed. The government couldn't pay its military. The military turned to clan militia, fighting the government, um, and then fighting one another. And we ended up with this terrible calamity. In retrospect, uh, it, uh, it's fair to say that I, I, I think we should have ratcheted down the foreign aid gradually as opposed to just cutting it off all at once. No one imagined. This is one of the problems in Somalia is, is you couldn't predict what you couldn't imagine. We didn't have any failed states in 1988. You know, we had weak ones, we had lousy ones, but we didn't have one that just completely collapsed like that. Uh, we know a lot more now uh, than we know then. There sure is. Yes. Yeah. In the midst of this otherwise pretty arid environment, uh, you've got two rivers uh, from the highlands of Ethiopia, the Juba and the Shebele. Uh, that is where much of the fighting is taking place. The two brigades that I referred to that are, that are liberating territory here um, are pushing Shabab out and then taking land from uh, the locals in both places, a very high value. Uh, areas. Um, it was also the site of the 2011 famine. Uh, paradoxically, this was the breadbasket of Somalia, and this is where 260,000 people starved in 2011, in part because Shabab was controlling it and was blocking food aid, in part because we suspended food aid because it was going into areas that was controlled by a designated terrorist group and that was against the Patriot Act. Um, there were a variety of reasons why that happened. Uh, but that group, that area continues to be really, really hard hit. Uh, many of the IDPs that I referred to in Mogadishu are from, from that area. And, and, and to make matters a little bit worse, um, Ethiopia, neighboring Ethiopia, um, is very much a developmentalist state. Uh, and one of its priori top priorities is damming up its rivers for hydroelectricity and selling the electricity to the whole region. And the Shabeli River is one of the ones that they're looking for, both for hydroelectricity and also for irrigated agriculture in its lowlands. That will divert water in the long run. Um, and dry up that breadbasket. I worry a lot about that in the long run. No one's talking about it now because we have so many short-term problems in Somalia. So when you t talk about this as a wicked problem, that state building has become a project rather than a desired outcome, what should the international community do? Mm -hmm. Should we continue doing what we're doing now? <laughs> The key with wicked problems, as I understand it, and I'm a layman trying to understand this systems engineering term, um, is that they're not solvable. And so you treat them as givens. 
rather than problems to be solved. And over time, sometimes a wicked problem becomes a tame problem if you let conditions change. Um, but right now, one of the things that we cannot do, if we diagnose a political system as one that is uh, that has per, a, a strong interest in perpetuating state failure, that sees state building as a project, not a desired outcome, uh, providing more money for it is only enabling it. It's making it worse. Uh, I would be in favor of reading the Riot Act to the government at this point um, and saying, you know, we are not going to continue to fund this. Will that work? No. And here's why. Uh, we're not the only players. There's so many other external actors now that are willing to throw money in Somalia to buy influence. Again, the Gulf states are much more involved as the so-called new, new actors. Turkey, much more involved than it used to be. China, much, eh, China's not yet really dabbling, but a little bit. Even Russia uh, coming back so that um, we could we have less leverage than we, we think we have on that score. Why Turkey? Turkey is extending its, uh, its um, interests uh, across all of Africa and the Middle East. It's been very aggressive in trying to become a, a bigger regional player. Turkish Airlines flies all over Africa now. There's a lot of Turkish companies. Turkish diplomacy for a time, that, to answer Lewis's question about a mediator, Turkey looked like the one. They, 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 were, they looked like they fit the bill, and so they were welcomed politically in places like Somalia. Um, they've got their own internal problems now, and that has tended to, to shrink the extent to which this, this very big outward focus, but they've got regional ambitions. Can you have a concrete strategy towards Somalia? Somali? Oh, another big question, yeah. <laughs> the African Union's strategy towards Somalia um, Wow, where to begin with this? Oh, okay, yeah, we, I've only got 40 seconds on this one. Uh, let, me just, let me just say this. The African Union um, is a, in many ways a problem in Somalia. Um, it, is, um, it has been abusive at times toward local populations. It's not welcome by most of the populations anymore, and yet we can't do without it. If it weren't there, the government would probably be in a world of trouble very quickly. So it needs to stay on. But what it doesn't have is an exit strategy right now. Um, uh, the government's forces aren't strong enough to protect themselves. Um, so we're kind of stuck with them. And there is, again, a political economy dimension to all this. Uh, there's a lot of money being made by some elements uh, at the commanding level of AMISOM and also at the foot soldier level. Well. I'm sure we could go on with this discussion because this was an incredibly rich talk and it just raises enormous numbers of challenges to try and think through where to go from here. But we've come to the end of our time, so we would like to thank you oh. for the lovely little box. <laughs> <laughs> Which may have thank, thank you very, very much. much thank you. Thanks and good luck with your studies.